Hey, y'all. I am so delighted to be here this evening to talk about what an intersectional feminist future actually looks like. But, you know, if we're ever going to achieve true gender equity, we need everybody on board. And that includes men, too. Feminism is not just about changing the ways we raise girls. It's also about redefining masculinity. We need men to be free, too, y'all. And I know Trayvon has thought a lot about this in his personal life, in the projects he creates, in the words he speaks. I'm so excited to talk to my homie about the fight for both racial and gender liberation, because as I like to say, no one is free until we're all free. So welcome, Trayvon. I am so grateful to be here with you. First of all, congratulations on Yaska. It's pretty fire. Thank you. Thank you. It's 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 still setting in. (laughs) You are not new to this. You are true to this because you were already an Emmy winning comedy writer. You wrote for The Daily Show. You wrote for Full Frontal with Samantha B. How did the idea of making two distant strangers actually come to you? You know, it started with seeing the repetition of, you know, Black people being killed on television and in, in, in the media. And it put that that feeling into my head and I said it out loud to to Zaria. I said, you know, this feels like the worst version of Groundhog's Day. Two Distant Strangers is a fictional take on a very real, seemingly endless loop of Black Americans being killed by the police, like you've already said. And I'm very sure that some viewers would hope that things would have turned out differently for the main character, a Black man named Carter, But spoiler alert, y'all, or perhaps it isn't a spoiler alert. He gets killed by the white cop every time. So what did you really want viewers to understand about the reality that Black people face? I wanted people to understand that the, the constant gaslighting that we get as Black Americans when we're told each one of these instances would have not happened had you done some performative behavior differently or had you complied with this or done that. I wanted people to understand just how like full of shit those things really are. Sorry if I can say that. Because okay. it it's true. <laughs> <laughs> right. Like to understand how, how ridiculous those assertions are and to present it to people in the way that we feel it. It's, it's all the things that um, we have to take with us every single day out into the world in order to survive and also perform and live and do be parents and, you know, be employees or be bosses or whatever it is. We have to do all that with all those stresses on top of carrying this with us every single day. So that was kind of what I wanted people to take away from it. I, um, know that we are resilient and yet wish we didn't have to be this resilient. So, I mean, do you, do you see any solutions from this epidemic of police violence against Black people? Like, do you see a way out of the loop? You know, I think I think there is a, a way out. I don't have, I don't think it's one thing. I think it's a combination of things. It's our efforts to to change our cities and states on local, on, lo- on the local level. So we have to first start by recognizing the system itself is is broken and we have to recognize where we can start to to repair it and and i think that starts with your your mayors and your local city councils and the people who are giving the money to these uh police departments and and looking at what that money is actually doing for for the citizens in those cities and so i don't have the you know the cure all which is why the movie ends the way it, it, it does and but I think there are definitely steps we need to take as, as citizens of this country in order to get ourselves to a point where not only are the police not killing a thousand people of all colors every year, that they aren't killing so many black people unnecessarily. I mean, this journey is obviously intersected with all the other oppressions, right? So I actually want to shift a little bit. You've said in conversations we've had and publicly that you consider yourself a feminist. So I want to know how you define your feminism and why do you feel it's important to actually fight racial, sexual and gender oppression all at the same time? You know, for me, I I define my feminism as the 
the necessary push for the equality of women everywhere. I know that the, the rising tide of, of that boat only helps the, not only myself, but the world. And well. I know, <laughs> right? I mean, I know firsthand what, what women are capable of when given the opportunity to, to not be hindered by uh, a, a patriarchal oppression for the sake of their gender. I've had the experience of even on, I tell people all the time, my experience at Full Frontal was beyond incredible because I was working with 90% women maybe even 95% women on that show. And having Mm. come off a show that was 90, probably 90% men, it was such a night and day experience. As a man in that space, you recognize all the ways in which you have to perform as a man in a space filled with men that you don't have to do in a space filled with women. It, It opened me up in a way that I wish every man could experience. There's this idea that somehow the equality of a woman equals the hindrance of a man. And it's that you see that same idea when it comes to race. Oh, if we give black people this many positions or this much power, it's at the detriment of white people. Yeah. We know it's not true. How do we actually create a new generation of men who are not constrained, not limited by those old fashioned ideas of hyper masculinity. You know, I think I think it starts at home. It's how we raise our boys, right? If we stop raising a generation of boys who don't cry, boys who are tough, boys who have to perform the script as it's been written, the moment you throw that script out and you your son comes to you in tears and you don't tell him to immediately wipe them away and to stop and to understand that your your masculinity is not tied to your toughness. It's the thing that's killing you. It's the poison in the well of manhood. You openly identify as bisexual. I'm interested what your own process in coming to question gender expectations has been like. How have you been thinking through what expectations have been placed on you and your performance of manhood? It was... In my late teens, when I was finally understanding who I was into my early 20s, I recognized where so many things I had been taught and so many ways I had been taught to be bumped up against who I felt I was. You know, for so long, I've been seen as this large masculine athlete who is what is what people hold up as the pinnacle of straightness and heterosexuality. And now I have an opportunity to debunk that myth with my existence, mm-hmm. right? I get to show up to a place and defy everything you know or think you know about sexuality and what, what straightness looks like. I mean, when we talk about the intersections of who any of us are, I'm curious how you think the ideas of Black masculinity and white masculinity differ. Yeah, you know, I think because black masculinity is so rooted in how we got to this country in the first place. In order to be black, you can't appear weak in the face of whiteness or Mm -hmm. white supremacy. And that is something we've carried with us since we gained our freedom in this country. And it's in our music, it's in our movies, it's in our, in, in every, almost every facet of black popular culture. And, and even our own, uh, our own home lives. It is when you walk out that door as a black man or woman, in a lot of families, you have to be tough. You have to be strong. You have to be all these things. And, and it makes sense because we have to protect ourselves. There was a period of time in this country where we were being openly murdered, lynched, killed for the color of our skin. And so we had to steel ourselves against that. I mean, while we're talking about young Trayvon, do you have advice for young men today that you wish maybe you would have heard back in the day yourself? Do you have a word for a young Trayvon, a word for all the young Trayvons in the world? Yeah, I mean, I guess if I, if I had to boil it down to a word, I would say, you know, truth, like Mm -hmm. live in, in what feels true to you. Like, 
because there is always going to be what you were told and how you were told to be. But if you have the choice to, to honor your truth at an early age, honor it because it will serve you and the world so much better as you become a, a, an adult in this society. It will ultimately create a better society for everyone when people have the ability to not only discover freedom, but to grow in, to grow with it, to grow into it. That's the word of the day, kids. Truth. Trayvon, thank you for bringing it to us like you always do. Um, you. If you are watching, you can continue this conversation on our upcoming episode of Undistracted out this Thursday on whatever platform you listen to your podcast on. Thanks for listening. Thanks for being. Thanks for doing. And Trayvon, thanks for being you. Thank you so much, Brittany. I love you so much. I love you too.